Hi, welcome back to um, the Vet Tech Online CE. We're continuing on with module 6.1 and we're going to talk about diseases of the endocrine system. So uh, the endocrine system can be separated into three sections. The central control, which is the pituitary and the hypothalamus, these two located in the brain, which are kind of like um, what controls the rest of the endocrine system. Um, we could also talk about the glands, which is like the thyroid gland, the adrenal glands, the gonads, the pancreas. And these are organs that, that are stimulated by the pituitary to actually produce a desired hormone that the body needs. Um, and we can also talk about within the endocrine system, the target organ where the hormones that are produced by these glands are carried through the bloodstream and then they hit the target tissue where they're going to produce a desired effect. So let's start with thyroid diseases. So hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism is common in dogs, very rarely seen in cats. I don't think I've ever seen it in a cat. Uh, clinical signs, there's going to be breed predisposition, so, um, and they're often middle-aged by the time that they're diagnosed. Uh, you'll see weight gain with no diet changes. So a lot of the time uh, we'll see this obese patient and we'll be thinking, oh, this owner is definitely overfeeding their patient or their pet. But then come to find out they have actually um, are feeding the right amount and there hasn't been a change. But all of a sudden there is an extreme weight gain. Um, they'll also notice a hair loss pattern. So there's going to be... Um, bilateral alopecia so on each side of the dog on on his um, side area usually around the flank um, you're going to see some hair loss there so the unfortunate thing is that um, Cushing's disease which is another type of endocrine disorder which we're going to talk about in a second and hypothyroidism have this bilateral bilateral symmetrical alopecia so once we see that we have to figure out which endocrine disease is causing that alopecia but it's going to be one of those two. You'll also notice your pati the, the patient's going to be cold intolerant. You may see some skin infections and their coat is going to be quite dry so you may see some flaky skin. Um, as far as diagnosing the hypothyroidism, 75% of these patients are going to have increased cholesterol. So when you do your uh, blood chemistry, you'll notice that. 25 to 40% also have a non-regenerative anemia. And so that's something that will happen secondary to the hypothyroidism. We would obviously do a thyroid test, uh, usually a T4 TSH. Uh, or a free T4 uh, and or an antithyroid antibody test. But uh, typically a T4 TSH will be done and that is going to tell us whether the um, animal is hypothyroid, which means a lower production of thyroid hormone is happening. So how do we treat uh, with medication that replaces the thyroid hormone? So we're actually going to give them synthetic thyroid hormones. This is going to be for life. Um, and then we do a blood test every six to 12 months just to make sure that we're maintaining a proper level of thyroid hormone. So this figure here are showing two beagles, one that is very obese and has hypothyroidism, and then the other one, which is a typical size. This here is also showing you pictures of the bilateral alopecia with hypothyroidism that I was telling you about. Uh, this um, this guy to your left is uh, quite has quite the uh, extensive alopecia as opposed to the other two guys over on the right that have uh, less extensive but still bilateral alopecia, significant of uh, either hypothyroidism or Cushing's disease. Okay, so we talked about hypothyroidism. Let's talk about hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism is common in cats. Again, I don't think I've ever seen it in dogs. 70% of affected patients will have an enlarged thyroid. Like you can see in this cat to your right, he has quite an enlarged thyroid that's actually very easily palpable. Clinical signs are gonna be middle-aged to older. 
they're going to be polyphagic to the max. They're going to be ravenously eating, but they're going to be losing so much weight. They may be vomiting, tachycardia. A lot of the times in the initial initial assessment, when we do the TPR, we're going to take a heart rate and it's going to be like 200 and something. It's amazing how tachycardic they are. And you may also um, hear a murmur in that heart. It's very normal. It's very common to hear that heart murmur in these hyperthyroid cats. They also are hyperactive. A lot of owners will say that they're running around like crazy cats in the middle of the night. And uh, obviously a clinical sign will be a palpable thyroid like you can see here. So how do we diagnose it? We take a history and a physical exam where we found the tachycardia, the murmur, the palpable thyroid, and uh, we'll also do a thyroid test. So a T4, just to see the elevation in the thyroid hormone. And uh, we'll also do some blood work. And in our, on our serum chemistry, we'll actually see an elevation in our liver enzymes. Very, very common to have that elevation. So how do we treat? There's four different options. Uh, most of the time, it's just by medication. But you could do surgery and remove the thyroid. But guess what's happened? Guess what happens if you just remove the thyroid? They actually become hypothyroid. So that's typically not done. Uh, radioactive iodine, which is an amazing treatment, is the treatment of choice. So what you do is the diseased thyroid tissue will take up a large amount of the radioactive iodine that was injected, and that will destroy that tissue and significantly decrease the thyroid hormone concentration. Now, this is the ideal treatment except for not, uh, it's only available in certain places and it costs a lot of money. So a lot of owners choose not to go that route and they go with the medication, okay, with an antithyroid drug like methimazole and uh, that can be given by mouth or even transdermally. So you can smear it on their ear and it will um, absorb transdermally. There's also a diet, which you can take a look at this website here that talks about it, um, that is YD and um, a lot of animals that that are hyperthyroid will go on this YD and they can actually be maintained on this diet and actually can keep their thyroid under control. This right here is showing you two hyperthyroid patients. They're very skinny. They typically tend to have sunken in eyes as well. Their coat just looks terrible, like as if they've just stopped grooming themselves. And also their nails are going to be really brittle, like they're going to be like sloughing off, like layers of their nails just going to be coming off. That's very commonly seen in hyperthyroid cats as well. Usually I can look at a cat that comes in because the owner is like, oh, he's just not doing well. I'll look at this cat and be like, oh, he looks hyperthyroid because uh, the clinical signs are quite specific. So this is a video here just to uh, show you hyperthyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Okay, so moving away from the thyroid, we're going to um, pancreatic diseases. So the most common pancreatic disease that we talk about uh, when it comes to the endocrine system is going to be diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus um, commonly affects cats. We actually see this a lot in cats, but again, very you can see it in dogs as well. Um, cells uh, use glucose as fuel in our body, okay? And glucose is converted to energy the body regulates the concentration of glucose in the circulation. Um, levels need to be maintained within a certain limit to ensure adequate fuel is always available for the cells in our body. The endocrine pancreas is an integral part of this process. So the pancreas will produce insulin, which facilitates the entry of the glucose into the cells and therefore out of the bloodstream. That's what insulin does. It takes glucose from your blood and brings it into the cell so that it can be used for energy. So how does um, diabetes mellitus develop? So the pancreas actually stops producing the right amount of insulin. Why this happens is idiopathic. We're not really sure. 100% of diabetic dogs and 50% of diabetic cats will have insulin dependent diabetes. Now this is typically called type one diabetes. That means that they are diagnosed with diabetes mellitus and they 100% need insulin to control um, their diabetes, so maintain a proper blood sugar. 50% um, of these diabetic cats will have non-insulin dependent diabetes, which is typically referred to as type 2 diabetes, where um, this can be controlled with just diet alone. Um, 
but this does not mean that cats do not need insulin. So we're going to talk more about that in a second. So as far as therapy goes, we'll feed them a high protein, high fiber diet, plus or minus insulin, depending on whether they need it, or an um, oral hypoglycemic, which isn't um, as commonly done, uh, the oral hypoglycemic. Typically, we would just go with the injectable insulin. Uncontrolled hyperglycemia results in a life-threatening condition called diabetic ketoacidosis. It is very important to know what this condition is and how to recognize it and why it's so dangerous because it is very common to see uncontrolled diabetic cats in clinic and they will often come in at this point when they are in DKA, when they have diabetic ketoacidosis. So the animal cell actually will start using fat for energy, which results in the creation of ketone bodies. These are acidic and accumulate in the blood, causing acidosis, which is a low pH. Your blood has a certain pH and it needs to be maintained at that pH. If it goes too high, it's too alkaline. If it goes too low, it'll be too acidic. Um, so dehydration and electrolyte balance will happen as well in DKA. Very dangerous, very life-threatening. So clinical signs of diabetes mellitus, uh, PUPD is a very, very common complaint. Weight loss, especially in cats. A lot of the time, they'll be um, previously chubby cats and then uh, started losing an amazing amount of weight. They're going to be polyphagic, so you're going to see an increase in appetite. They're going to be ravenous, kind of like hyperthyroidism, right? So you have to be careful because clinical signs can be very similar. Uh, they're going to be dehydrated. They're going to have that very poor coat, kind of like hyperthyroidism, right? It looked like they just kind of gave up on grooming themselves. And um, cats may also do uh, walk on their hawks. Like you can see in this picture up here and the videos down below here are going to show you exactly that. So it's very, it's commonly seen in these uh, diabetic cats or untreated diabetic cats that they'll actually do what we call a hawk walk. So they'll actually, their legs like they'll bend down and they'll actually be walking on their hawks. It's very strange to see, but it's a very common clinical signs in uh, untreated diabetic cats. So uh, one thing that as a technician you have to be aware of is there's diabetes mellitus and then there's diabetes insipidus. We have to know the difference between the two. Diabetes mellitus is kind of like what I just said, it's ca characterized by high levels of glucose in the body, um, while diabetes insipidus is a disease in which the kidneys are unable to conserve water. So it just dumps it out. So what's happening is the hypothalamus doesn't produce enough antidiuretic hormones. So this is a hormone that's produced by the hypothalamus that will help the body resorb uh, the water so to, to keep us hydrated, right? Um, and the animal can only produce a dilute urine in when they're lacking this, this antidiuretic hormone. So it's just dumping out all the water. So diabetes insipidus is a rare disease while diabetes mellitus is very common. When we just use the worm, word diabetes, we tend to be referring to diabetes mellitus. The cause, symptoms, treatments, and prognosis for both of these are very different. So when we talk about diabetes because of hyperglycemia and insulin, we're talking about diabetes mellitus. Diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with the pancreas and insulin. It has to do with the kidneys and how it's just dumping out all the water. Why it's even called diabetes insipidus, I don't know. It's very, very deceiving. So with these diabetic cats, we'll do a glucose curve. So after, um, so when they first get diagnosed with diabetes, we need to figure out what's the dose of insulin we're going to give because we have to worry about giving too much insulin. If we give too much insulin, they will become hypoglycemic. And then all of a sudden their blood sugar is way low and that's very dangerous. They can actually go into a coma and die. So we have to be very careful. So we'll get them in for a glucose curve. We'll bring them into the hospital and keep them there for 12 hours. So usually morning till night. Um, after they are given their first meal um, w and prior to giving the actual insulin that we're going to give them, we take a blood sample. Now, chances are they're going to be hyperglycemic because they're diabetic. And for the next 12 hours, blood samples are going to be collected every two hours, if possible, and check the glucose level using a glucometer. So we're going to take a look at this blood glucose and hopefully it's going to go down to the normal ranges, which is roughly five, give or take. 
These values are then plotted on a graph. Now, I can't say that I've ever made a graph in clinic when I've done a glucose curve. Typically, we just kind of make a notation of the blood glucose and make sure that it is going down to a normal level and not too far low because then we have hypoglycemia and that's dangerous too. So based on that curve, the vet can determine whether the insulin dose needs to be increased or decreased or maybe even kept the same. So there's a video here to help you guys understand that. Hypoglycemia. <clears throat> so hyperglycemia is not fatal, at least not uh, acutely, right? Like chronic hyperglycemia obviously has a lot of very negative uh, side effects, hence why we treat for diabetes. But hypoglycemia is very fatal. So too much insulin can cause a dangerous decrease in the blood glucose. This can cause weakness, restlessness, uncoordination, seizures, and coma. If a client with a diabetic call pet calls and says that the animal's acting strange, you don't take any chances. You tell them to come in right away. And then you check their blood glucose the second they get there. And if it's under three, they are hypoglycemic and in danger. And then in that case, you would want to give them some oral, um, some oral corn syrup or, or honey, something that's high in sugar to help bring that blood glucose back up. If they are unconscious and they can't swallow the corn syrup or the honey, in that case, you would actually just smear it onto their gums and it will absorb into their uh, system through the mucous membrane. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the adrenal glands. So hypoadrenocorticism. Now, hypoadrenocorticism is AKA Addison's disease. So um, it's usually idiopathic. We're not really sure why this happens. The adrenal cortex actually atrophies, causing a decrease in the adrenal hormone levels. So we know that the adrenal gland, which is uh, responsible for fight or flight, right? They, are, um, they produce a steroid which helps us maintain homeostasis. So glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids is what's excreted by that adrenal gland. And um, in cases of Addison's disease or hypoadrenocorticism, and, and the name should give it away, right? Hypo means low, adreno means adrenal gland, and corticism is referring to the cortex in a condition of that specifically. So it's uncommon in dogs and very rare in cats. So Addison's disease isn't um, that often seen a lot less common than its uh, sister condition, which is uh, Cushing's disease. But uh, nonetheless, it can be seen. Um, clinical signs, uh, what they call the great pretender. So um, the hard thing about this is that Addison's disease actually mimics, um, the clinical signs actually mimic many other conditions. So it's very hard to diagnose um, Addison's disease because we're always thinking it's something else. There'll be lethargic, weight loss, vomiting, diarrhea, PUPD, and uh, the unfortunate thing about Addison's disease is that they can um, develop or end up in um, an Addisonian crisis where they're flat, they're in shock, they're dehydrated, and this um, requires intensive care and hospitalization for stabilization. How do we diagnose this? We do some blood work. Electrolytes are really important in this. The uh, sodium potassium ratio is going to be less than 27 to 1, which is consistent with Addison's. We'll also do an ECTH stimulation test. So, um, uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone stimulation test, right? ACTH stands for adrenocorticotropic hormone, which is produced by the pituitary gland, okay? So ACTH is produced by the pituitary gland, which tells the pituitary gland, let's go, we need to make some steroids. And then the pituitary gland would typically respond to that by spitting out some steroids. So um, this test, uh, testing the hormone levels will usually give a definitive diagnosis. So basically what we do is we give a synthetic ACTH that should stimulate the pancreas or sorry, the adrenal glands to produce steroids. If they don't, then we know that that patient has hypoadrenocorticism because we're using ACTH to stimulate it. That pancreas should be producing steroids. Um, how do we treat it? We supplement the adrenal hormone and, um, hospitalization for supportive care when they're in crisis. Now, the opposite of hypoadrenocorticism is hyperadrenocorticism. This is commonly known as Cushing's disease. It's common in dogs, but rare in cats. 
there's going to be a hyper secretion of cortisol. So the steroid hormone produced by the adrenal glands, there's going to be too much of it being produced. It's often caused by over medicating with steroids called, um, and this is called iatrogenic Cushing. So we induced that we accidentally made that happen by giving too much steroids. Um, so the causes, it could be pituitary dependent or adrenal dependent. So pituitary secretes a large amount of ACTH. Okay, so the pituitary gland is secreting too much ACTH. So it causes the adrenal glands to produce too much steroids. Okay. Um, and, uh, and also the excess cortisol would normally stop the pituitary, right? Because when the adrenal gland, the pituitary gland is going to secrete ACTH. It's going to stimulate the adrenal glands to start producing steroids. That increase in steroids in our blood is then going to tell the pituitary gland, okay, stop, we're good. So it's going to stop producing that ACTH. That's normally. A lot of the time, that is what we call a negative feedback is not going to be responding. So it's just going to continue, continue, continue producing ACTH, even though we're good, right? So there's just too much happening. Um, there could be an adrenal tumor, which also causes an increase in cortisol. So whether it's a pituitary issue or whether it's an adrenal issue, tumors secrete cortisol despite the lack of ACTH stimulation. So it really has nothing to do with the uh, ACTH. It's just producing cortisol all on, all on its own. Clinical signs of um, Cushing's disease is going to be, uh, sometimes it actually goes completely unnoticed. They're asymptomatic. They may have PUPD and polyphagia, excessive panting. They're going to have this pot belly, kind of like you can see in this cute little dog here, and uh, bilateral symmetrical alopecia, like you can also see in this dog. Now remember, bilateral, bilateral symmetrical alopecia often happens as well with um, hyperthyroidism. Or sorry, hypo thyroidism. And uh, you may also have some muscle weakness. How do we diagnose this? We do some blood work. We may see some increased liver enzymes and cholesterol. Um, you can do an ACTH um, a stimulation test, kind of like we, we described in the last one. But we can also do a dexamethasone a, a suppression test. So a dex suppression test. So dex, which is um, a synthetic steroid, similar to what's produced by your adrenal gland, um, is injected and it should decrease the ACTH production, right? Because that's the way the body works. Increase in steroid in the in the adrenal gland uh, will do the negative feedback up to the pituitary and the pituitary should stop producing ACTH. Um, so normal healthy patients, it's going to it's going to decrease the ACTH, and uh, you'll see a decrease in cortisol level up, upon administration of the dexamethasone. Um, but with Cushing's disease, you're not going to see any change. So um, in the blood cortisol, so you have to uh, so you can do that test, and it will be definitive. So um, how do we treat? Cushing's disease, uh, we could do what's called benign neglect. So this just means we do nothing about it um, because a lot of the time the animal is going to be completely asymptomatic anyway. So there's no need to um, take extreme measures to um, to fix this because they're not uh, sometimes not really affected by it. Or we could do medication. There's several options, um, uh, but veteral is probably the most commonly used. Uh, it's a lifelong disease. It can be very serious. Clinical signs of over-medicating are identical to those of Addison's disease, which makes sense, right? If we over-medicate, we're going to cause hypoadrenocorticism. Uh, prognosis, patient tends to live about two years after the diagnosis, but unfortunately, it's usually um, diagnosed in older animals, so their life expectancy at that point isn't very good anyways.